Hi, welcome. So glad to have this opportunity to teach. My name is Zaina. I'm a physical therapist and Pilates instructor. I have started Synergy Plus 20 plus years ago. And Anna and I have, um, she's been super passionate about Ehlers-Danlos and hypermobility. We've been working on it for quite some time. Um, she spearheaded the idea of getting a community of people together so that we could um, share more about it and help people just move forward who have hypermobility and educate people about it, also build a community around hypermobility. I'm going to give you a little introduction um, about anatomy, and then Anna is going to jump in, talk to you about some other really cool things. So um, here we go. We wanted to present the upper quadrant uh, and talk a little bit about what's going on, why we've even picked this area, and just some really basic things that you can use or basic understanding so that when we get to the exercises, it makes sense. We understand that everybody with a hypermobility dysfunction is very individual. So uh, it's all really going to be a very individual process. I don't think there is a single formula that works for any one person anyway in general, but especially when we're talking about hypermobility. So anything that we do today in class, um, if it's not right, for, if you are hypermobile and you're attending and it's not right for your body, please stop. Don't do it. Um, you can modify it. We are going to do a few exercises on the roller. That's going to work for some people, but it's not going to work for some people who are really, really mobile in the shoulders. So Anna is going to take you through some of those exercises, but you're always welcome to modify, to come off the roller, use the mat only, um, and then make the exercises right for yourselves. And then again, if you have questions, we are going to leave some time at the end to answer those questions. So. I just wanted to talk a little bit about the shoulder in general. Um, I wanted to show you, this is Francesca, my friend Francesca, and I just wanted to talk to you about, when we talk about the shoulder, um, most people just think about this shoulder joint, right? So that, well, that's one of the shoulder joints, the glenohumeral joint, this ball in its socket. But I also wanted to mention quickly that the, there's a big ball, there's not a very big socket, right? Uh, I don't really see much of a socket. At the hip, for example, we have a ball and a socket. That looks like a ball and socket. This looks like a ball sitting kind of in something that's a little cut out, but not like the hip, which is fantastic for mobility. But guess what? It's not fantastic for stability, right? So keep that in mind that we get this beautiful range of motion. For somebody who's hypermobile, it's often way too much motion at the shoulder, and that we don't really have a bony structure keeping it in position as much as we do at the hip. So that's why the shoulder tends to be a little more unstable. We tend to see a little bit more subluxations in the shoulder because it just doesn't have the bony structure. The other thing I like to mention when I talk about the shoulder, I never like to only talk about this joint. We have the acromioclavicular joint, which is this right on the top. This is right here, your pointy bone at the top where your scapula and your clavicle actually meet. So for me, that is it actually is a joint. It's ligamentous and it has a tiny little disc in there. It has to have a little tiny bit of motion for us to be able to lift our arm all the way up. But it also is there to create stability. So I, I like to call it the top of the joint. The top of the shoulder is this AC joint, right? So we have this glenohumeral we have this AC joint and then the other thing we like to, I like to talk about is the scapula thoracic region right so the scapula your shoulder blade is sitting on your rib cage this also has to be able to move around on top of the rib cage right if I can't move that scapula then I can't get full range of motion at my shoulder um if I have a scoliosis or something that's preventing gliding or um, a different shape on one side than the other, then I'm going to have a little bit of difficulty also moving that shoulder blade around. So, um, or I might not have enough muscular st support to really stabilize with this shoulder joint, right? So we'll talk about, for us today, our focus is really stability of the shoulder since we're talking about a hypermobile population. Most of the time, we're looking at trying to stabilize that shoulder. So we're going to talk about how 
we're going to use um, the whole shoulder structure, if you would, to stabilize that shoulder. And then I just wanted to um, mention a few muscles. So I'm going to use TheraBands to explain, and I'm going to use Tiziano to do that. So a lot of times what happens in poor shoulder and uh, function is that we get an overbalanced uh, overbalance or an underbalance of muscles. So if you want to imagine that we have, I like to talk about the upper trapezius, right? It's coming into the top of his neck from here at his shoulder. So maybe turn sideways, right? So we've got upper trapezius fibers running in this direction. We have, but we also have middle trapezius, which is running sideways and lower trapezius return, which is running downward. We also have lats running downward. So we've got actually bigger, more musculature in the downward direction than we do in the upward direction, which is kind of ironic because what's the posture that we see people in compensation patterns for most of the time is this upward. We're holding upward and we're going forward. So a lot of our focus is gonna be on how do we balance that upward work with the lower work and create some stability in this quadrant in order to allow proper shoulder mechanics to, and to create a little bit more stability. So that would include for those of you who are muscle, like to know names of muscles, we're talking about really lower trapezius, we're talking about lats, we're talking about teres major, we're talking about rhomboids, and we're definitely gonna talk about serratus anterior, which is the one that's gonna hold his shoulder blade flush with his back. And um, a lot of hypermobile people do not have that connection. They have the winging, right? That's usually because serratus anterior is not doing its job, right? Um, or has too big of a job to do. So, so that I know is a lot of information in a very short period of time, but just so that you have some pictures in your head as we go into these exercises. Um, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Anna who will introduce herself and talk to you a little bit about uh, posture and alignment. So kind of just picking up on where Dana was, was leaving off, uh, taking some of those muscles, she was talking about some of those joints and making sure they're in the right places. So if my bony structures are in the right place, then most likely the right muscles will turn on, those lower traps will turn on, serratus muscles, the serratus anterior will turn on, so thinking about taking your, your joints or your body parts, your head and your shoulders, you wanna make sure they're stacked. And those head and shoulders are stacked over your hips. The way I like to think about alignment for me, which really helps, is that if I stack things like building blocks and I really accurately put them one on top of the other, really very accurately, they're gonna be really supportive, they're gonna be really strong against force. If I have just the littlest bit of shearing forward or back, then I'm not gonna be so strong. And I, for myself, the image I have in my brain is like a Jenga, where you've got those little blocks that you pull out and you pull one out just a little too far and it wouldn't hopefully completely fall apart onto the floor, but it's just not as solid. It's not as good for load. So that's the first part of kind of the alignment um, conversation is that we're having our head over our shoulders and we're having our head and shoulders over our hips with those building blocks. And then more specifically to talk about kind of where Zaina was already picking up on is, for example, the head. I wanna think of length through the crown of the head, but that crown of the head that I wanna think of getting length from isn't too far forward at the top of my head, and it's not too far back at the back part of my head. It's kind of that little E place that we had when we were born that was a little soft, and it's growing tall from that part of my head to create that length in the neck and also to help with that alignment of the shoulder, the head over the shoulders. So for example, if I did, for example, um, not great to do, but if I did pull that chin a little too much and try to get tall that way, what's happening is I'm turning on all of these muscles in the front, my neck flexors, and I'm stretching in the back, but that's not balanced, right? It's a lot, it's not a lot. Same thing if I jump forward, I've got tension in the back, but I've got no work in those neck flexors, so that's not that, kind of balanced work front and back that's gonna hug 
be in that place to support. So we want to think about the right muscles turning on when we put our head in the right place. And part of that for me when I think about it is where my chin is, and that really helps me, and where the crown of my head is. So that like out. And then the next place I go to is shoulders. So I've got my head in the right place, and I want to think about where my shoulders are. And Zaina kind of talked about this a little bit. I could pull my shoulders up, which would be getting me into those upper trapezius muscles right here. It's kind of, I think of my stressor muscles when I'm stressed out on the like, for a long time. It's those muscles, and I'm gonna, like, let those go. But there's a whole bunch of other traps that, trap is huge, right? It starts high, and it goes low, and I, I do want some of those traps, but I want them more that mid-trap and lower trap area, along with those rhomboids in the middle to hold my shoulders, my shoulder blades in the right place. So for example, just like with the head, if I roll my shoulders forward, I have too much work in the front. My pectoral muscles, my chest muscles, all those muscles in the front are working really hard, but I'm dead in the back. There's nothing going on back there to support me. All those lovely muscles Dana talked about. But then I also don't want to overcompensate the pull of way back and squeeze and pin my shoulder blades together. Because if I squeeze and pin my shoulder blades together, I'm not going to really be able to move my arms that's not really functional, but I've turned on all those muscles in the back and I've stretched in the front, but I'm not balanced. I don't have that kind of hug front and back, but that equal work from our, our muscles in the front and back. And ideally we want that kind of feeling of hug. And then more specifically going down now to the shoulder blades, if I do with my shoulders, roll my shoulders forward, I get that kind of roundness in my shoulder blades too. And I don't want to have my shoulder blades there. I want to have my shoulder blades nice and flat on my back with my shoulders wide. And as Dana was saying, part of, we sometimes refer to it as a false joint, the rib cage, the connection to the shoulder and the shoulder blades, because we want to have a relationship for our shoulder and arm movement of our shoulder blades and our ribs. And that relationship is a gliding relationship. We want to have our shoulder blades flat on our back so that our, our shoulder blades, as we move our arms up and down or, or side to side, that they can just glide along the ribcage. But if I'm a little forward and not in the correct alignment with all of those body parts, it really restricts where I can move my arms. So that's why we kind of, and then and then as, as with good alignment, we get good posture. And if we get good posture, we get the right muscles turning on to support your body. So really thinking of, Hopefully, ideally, if I put things in the right place, the right muscles will turn on to support and hug the joints in the right way. And if they don't, then I've got something else going on, and then I address that lazy muscle and turn on. So that's just kind of a, a little preview. Does that make sense? Questions about anything say not or I had to say? Okay. Yeah. Any, any more? Anything you want to chime in, say not on? No, I think we're good. We're good. So should we should we move to the next next place? Yes, let's do that. So the, the first place we're gonna start, and, and again, as Zaina was saying, I'm gonna have Kim here and she's gonna be doing the exercises, and then Tiziana is gonna be the Zoom person who's gonna be there for Zoom people to watch the exercises. And the first place we're gonna start with exercises is not actually particularly addressing the upper quadrant is going to be addressing what supports the upper quadrant, which is the center, doing two exercises that give you that support. Because if I have support below in my deep abdominals, then my shoulders and my head are going to have that foundational support to be supported. We want to have our upper body supported. So we're going to start with, and, and we're going to, and it's, I, I, people here, I've made you a little list if you want to take notes of where we're going. So we're going to start with what I call uh, rib breathing, and it's with weights so when we feel comfortable with that. We, we also have towels if you need one in the corner to prop your head if you feel comfortable right now. But I'll demonstrate what we're going to do so you can kind of get an idea of how you want to modify or, or how it feels in your body. So Kim is just going to definitely lay down onto her back, as you mind. She's going to bend her knees comfortably. And it might also be nice to have a ball between her knees just to support her and give her a little bit of feedback. She could have a towel under her head and she felt like her neck and shoulders weren't in the right position. And if it feels okay to have feedback, I'm gonna put this uh, okay. I'm gonna put this um, book on her belly, and then this weight is gonna go right onto her belly to weight that book on her belly and weight her rib cage. So the idea with this, this idea of weighting the rib cage and breathing, is that with people who are hypermobile, 
I do this every day for myself because I'm hypermobile. Yeah, I don't let the weight fall off. You might even want to put your hand on it, Tim. You're going to do a thrust of three things in and out. But, but, but I kind of start my day like this. It feels really good for people, for me particularly, but sometimes for people with hypermobility, that if you have feedback like that weight and that look as you breathe, it can ground your ribcage and give you some support. Same thing with the ball. The ball between the knees gives us such support, gives us some feedback. So, and touching hands give us feedback. So as we do this, think that supporting your body with feedback, whether it's a weight, whether it's a ball, whether you're with your hands, that can really help us as hypermobile people kind of find what we need to support ourselves. So for our practice today, the rib breathing that we do at Pilates and, and you're doing today is rib breathing. And that rib breathing, as she inhales, those ribs expand. And as she exhales, the ribs contract, right? You know that, that's the breathe. But specifically for rib breathing, to keep the abdominals in the picture as we breathe, we want to think of the breath coming from the sides of the ribs out to the right and left. And posteriorly into the mat, into the back side of the rib cage. So I'm not thinking of anterior motion of the, of the rib cage up to the sky. I'm thinking out to the sides and back into the mat. The mat's already there to give her feedback to breathe into her rib cage in the back. But if she wanted to take her hands for extra feedback, she could place her hands right at the side of her rib cage and hug her rib cage. And she could encourage that breath to come into her rib cage as she opens. She closes. The last thing before we kind of try this for, for a moment, I'm just going to talk about two more things, is that when she exhales, so we're focusing on the opening, right? The opening of each to the sides of the back. But when she closes, her ribs get closer together, her belly gets small, her waist gets small. And if she thinks of sinking her belly button, fully exhaling her abs turn on naturally, right? They're supposed to. So we get that ab connection. So it's finding that organizing the ribs. And it's fine to ask. So that's going to be the first part. And then the second part, we're going to add a gentle ball squeeze on the exhale to then help her further find those lower abdominals, her transverse abdominals, and knitting together the center and her pelvic floor up and in, which is going to further give that center support. If I aggressively squeeze that ball, I'm going to kill it, puncture it. I'm going to take over the work of those subtle muscles of my deep abdominals, my pelvic floor, with my inner thighs. And those muscles are going to say, I don't need to do anything. I've got the inner thighs to do all the work. So that squeeze is even smaller. It's even smaller than that. It's just like the tiniest little bit of like hello or hug to the ball. Because I want an opportunity for my pelvic floor and my deep abdominals to turn on. So first exercise, we're just gonna focus on the breathing and then we're gonna add that tiny little ball squeeze. So if you're ready to join, you're gonna get yourself comfortable if you need a, anything under your head to support your head so that you're shoulders in your head or in a good position. You're gonna bend your legs and take that ball if it's okay and put it between your knees. Take your, and you don't have to do this with weight, right? You could do this breathing and squeezing without that weightedness if it feels um, un unnatural or, or not good. You can modify and just breathe without anything onto your tummy. But you're just going to take that ball, uh, take that hook onto your belly and take that weight if it's okay. You're going to take some nice big breaths into your rib cage, just nice and easy. And then on an exhale, you're just going to feel how the weight just, how the breath just falls out of you, how the ribs start to come together. You're just going to allow yourself to sink. And just try that again. Big, expansive rib cage opening. And then exhale, just finding that knittedness together of those ribs and feeling that sinking of the belly, sinking of the belly, sinking of the belly, and feel those bones. Again, if you wanted to add the hands onto the sides of the ribs to so feel that openness to the right and left sides of the ribs, feel free to add that. If it doesn't feel comfortable through your shoulders, you don't need to, but that feet might be nice. It's also feeling those ribs open to the back of the mat, and it's those really wide ribs opening. Inhale. And then again, feeling those ribs move as you find the belly. You feel that knittedness of your center. You feel your belly sink. You feel your abs turn on. Now with this next breath, same, same concept, right? Still rib, rib breathing, opening up. On your next exhale, you add the tiniest squeeze of that ball. 
see what that gives you as uh, And you're just adding that little bit of hug and squeeze in the ball as you exhale. Just feeling those abdominals connect as you do that. And let's just do that two more times. Because we want to know where all those muscles are in the center as we move on to our upper quadrant. Again, like we talked about, we have the support for what's up above. Have that nice foundational support of those lower abdominals, transverse abdominis, pelvic floor. For sure, turning on. Last breath, inhaling into the sides of the ribs. And then exhale, just feeling that, that breath easily go out of you, feeling your waist and ribs get nice and small and feeling that gentle up. And then if you'd like, you're just going to take that ball and weight to the side, but keep your ball right where it is between your knees. So just ball and weight go to the side. Oh, look. So I think I see the ball and Ball and weight. Yeah, that didn't work. Book and ball or weight or whatever. Take your stuff off your belly. And you're just going to take your hands onto your belly so you get a little bit of feedback. And I want you to see as you, again, you inhale into the sides of the ribs. You're going to find those nice open rib cage. And then as you exhale again, you're going to feel the ribs knit together. You're going to feel your belly sink. You're going to feel your waist get smaller. But this time, keep exhaling until there's nothing left. And then take one of your fingers and just gently palpate where your belly button is. And just feel that kind of tautness that happens at the end of the exhale. Yeah, I'm feeling those deep. There's a little give, but not too much. And try that a couple more times. So now you're getting to feel those muscles turn on. Inhale into the sides of the ribs. And then exhale, ribs get smaller, waist gets smaller, and you keep exhaling and exhaling and exhaling. At the very end of the exhale, you're just going to take that finger, palpate your tummy, and see that little bit of feedback you get when you do that. And do that two more times, doing that feedback. And the way I imagine that feedback with those deep abdominals, you're looking at transverse abdominals here, it's deep abdominals, it's our, our deepest layer of our abdominals, it's underneath a lot of other stuff. So it's going to be really deep down in there. So the feeling I have when I do this, I'm just going to do it a couple more times, is that when I completely exhale and I palpate my tummy, just poke gently on my tummy, right around where my belly button is, it's if I have a bowl that's covered with saran wrap. And it's not that there isn't some, it's not that there isn't some give, but there is some tautness to it. But it's not too hard. It's not like a wall or a rock. But there's some formation of those abdominals contracting. So there's some pushback when you poke your belly. Hopefully you guys were able to feel that as you did that. And now that you've felt your center, we're going to gently take the ball out and roll to your side or come up however is easiest for your body and most functional. And we're going to move to the next two exercises if there aren't any questions. Right, so finding that subtle work of the center with those deep abdominals, again, will feel really subtle because they're very deep. It's not like our superficial abdominals, our rectus abdominals right on top, they're going to slap you in the face and you feel that right away. So just making sure that you have that subtlety happening. So if there's no questions, we're going to keep on. I love it. <laughs> and as you're breathing, do you let your back go down flat or do you try not to do that? Right, stay pay attention to that at all. I try to pay attention to my neutral spine, and if anybody doesn't know what neutral spine is, it's just the natural curves of your spine. So, if, for example, we have a little curve at our lower back. So, um, if you lay onto your back with your neutral and natural spine, you might have a little space at your lower back. But if we imprint it and we took that lower back and put it onto the mat, for some people that feels more supportive, you get feedback, right, again. Some people, it feels less supportive to be in neutral. So if you need that feedback of imprinting your lower back, then I think you should do it, or you can put something there to get that back. But it's not my goal. My goal isn't to, to take my lower back to the mat. My goal is to, to actually hug this way. So I feel kind of that, that trans, the muscle fibers, the transverse abdominals run this way, like a corset or like, I just had back surgery, like a back brace. So it really hugs me in and I really feel that center. That's its job, that transfer pseudonymous. But its job isn't necessarily to imprint your lower back. Cami had a question about uh, feet together. Um, I usually have my feet on the ground, if that's what we're talking about, laying down. I try to be, if Kim could just come down. If you have the ball between your knees, right, just place the ball between your knees. I like to keep my, my legs right where they are here. So they're kind of hip bone distance. 
if I didn't want the ball and I just wanted to have feedback from my, I'm going to take the ball now. <laughs> just like death grip. <laughs> just like not going to let it go. Um, if I don't, if I don't have the ball, yeah, feedback with ankle bones and knees together, that would be fine too. But if I had the ball, I don't know that I would want to bring my feet together because that would be a a, we a weirder angle. Yeah, you, her her happen? feet looked like they were sort of pigeon toeing, and I wasn't sure if that was instructional or whether that was when the ball was in. Um, yeah, so her toes should be pointing straight forward. Straight just forward. how her knees are pointing straight forward. And she's doing a good job of that now, if you can see it. Okay. And then if she had the ball, it would be the same thing, whether or not she had the ball, but she's kind of lining up her ankles and her knees. So they're like train tracks. Okay. okay. And, we and I can, sorry, let me add one thing. I'll let you continue. The interesting thing about that is if you toe in, and maybe you already know this, but if you do toe in a little bit, it does tend to activate the pelvic floor a little bit more. So if you had somebody who were, you were particularly focused on pelvic floor strengthening, you could intentionally pigeon toe in a little bit, not ex not too much, just a little pigeon toe in. Then when they put that light pressure on the ball, it automatically kind of activates the pelvic floor just a little bit more. So just a little tidbit. Sorry, I interrupted. Go ahead. The, the other question I had was, and I'm an EDS or MCAS POTS, all that stuff. Um, I found myself um, in the part where, where our abs were supposed to be going down, um, naturally wanting to pull my shoulders forward, which I imagine is part of the aberrant movement pattern. Um, and I was curious if you guys have any advice for that tendency. You go ahead, Zaina. And I Okay. Yeah. So one of the things, and Anna and I actually, we're going to, are going to bring this up later too. One of the things I like to do, usually that's a sign of either pulling, working too much or just tightness in the upper structure. So tightness in the pecs, tightness in the chest region. So one of the things that I love to do is just turn the palms upward. It's instead of palms downward on the floor, palms upward tends to externally rotate the shoulders, not with force, just gently. And then let, um, a, a, let that body just sort of fall to the floor there, the shoulder blades fall, and then you'll activate your abdominals as much as you can before you peel them back off the floor. So it may be that the abdominal contraction in this position has to be a little bit less for the moment. Yeah, go ahead, Gloria. I have a comment about that. A lot of times the shoulders are so uh, unstable that laying back, they, they go out of alignment. Um, so you're holding them in. So one thought might be to support uh, most of your shoulder with, you know, a little towel both sides so you don't have to hold them. Like here, like right on the sides. I, I mean, underneath the back. Underneath the shoulders, yeah. 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 Great. Any other thoughts, questions? No? Great. Thank you guys so much for that. And it's all you. <laughs> awesome. So we're now we are going to go up into the upper quadrant now that you've got your center support. This is again where you could do this on a roller if you if that gives you good feedback. Or if you feel more comfortable, you can do it with something under your head laying down or just laying down with not something under your head. Do you have a preference? Well, actually, we'll do it both ways. So she's going to lay down and she can have that ball between her knees if she wants a little bit of feedback. She's going to get comfortable. And if she wants to toe in a little bit to get that pelvic floor, she could do that a little bit. She could have something under her head if she needs that for getting her shoulders and her shoulder blades in the right position. And the first thing we're going to do um, is take the arms up to the sky. And I want you to think with all of this movement with our bodies, if you are hypermobile like me, that we have a lot of possibility of movement. But I'm not really looking for full range of motion with any of this. I'm not going to my extremes, whether that's an extreme up or an extreme down. It's just getting some movement to find the right muscles to turn on. It's not about aggressively clamping down or aggressively separating. But we had talked about the shoulder and the shoulder blade position for alignment and that the shoulders should be wide out to the sides of the room, not too far forward, not too far back. And that the shoulder blades should be flat on your back so they can glide on your rib cage. So I don't wanna have my shoulders too far back or too, too far forward or too far back. So we're gonna practice that in what's called a shoulder slap or shrug. So it's just gonna be an inhale of her fingertips up to the sky, her shoulder blades will separate a little bit. They may come off the floor. And again, it's not a big range of motion. 
And gravity on her exhale just lets her shoulders settle into that wide position and her shoulder blades flat on the mat so she can feel the proper placement of her shoulder and shoulder blades. She inhales and separates. She's got too much work in the front. And then she just allows gravity. She's not forcing it. She just allows gravity to draw her shoulders wide and her shoulder blades flat. We're, we're doing that rib breathing, right? We're inhaling into the sides of the ribs. And then we're exhaling, finding those deep abdominals as we find those shoulder blades nice and wide. Now we're going to demonstrate the next exercise here, which is kind of finding the relationship of arm movement and rib cage. And that when we move our arm, we don't want to necessarily pop our rib cage, which is one of my favorite things to do is just to pop my rib cage to move my arm. And then I lose my ab support in the center. So she's going to take her right arm up to the sky. She's going to take her left arm on her right rib cage. Yeah, same sided. So she's got a right arm. She's got a right left hand with a right rib cage. And she's going to have that. She just did her. Let's do one shrug. So she knows she's going to shrug it up. And then she knows, okay, I'm in a good position. Shoulder is down. She's got her fingertips up to her sky with her palm facing in towards her ear. And she's going to inhale and start to bring her arm overhead as she gently draws her rib cage towards her hip bone. And then she's going to bring her arm back up to the sky. It's not about that the arm has to go high. It's about finding that the ribs don't move as the arm moves. And if I keep my ribs still and in place with that gentle, not aggressive, pull down of the rib cage towards my hip bones, my abs are going to support my heavy arm bone going over my head. My abs are going to turn on. So if she took that um, arm up to the sky, thanks, Kim, and she took that hand or left hand and she put it on her belly like we tapped our belly before, like we did that little test to make sure our abs were turning on. As she inhales or exhales overhead, if she taps her tummy, she should feel some reaction in her center when her arm goes overhead, yeah, that support that we need if we reach for a plate overhead, should feel something tactile happen in her center and then come back up. Again, arm goes overhead. I should feel my center react to that. Nice, Kim. That looks beautiful. And I should feel my rib cage really not react to that. My rib cage still, still stay kind of quiet. Now, all of this can be done on a roller. Do, do all of you feel like you need a demonstration on the roller or you kind of get the concept? concept. So you choose if you want to be on the floor and supported. Again, you can have a ball between your knees if you like that support. You could also bring ankles and knees tighter together. Just if you're on a roller with ankles and knees tight together, just know that's a, a small base of support. So it could feel like a lot of balance work. And I don't want you to have to struggle to balance on your roller here. So you can you can be just keep doing it or you can walk around. It's totally up to oh, I have your roller. Yeah, thank you. You have my roller. So you're going to get yourself on that roller. You just going to be nice and gently there. Ball is either between your knees or not. And you're just going to settle and organize that rib cage with just a big breath into the sides of the ribs like we practiced earlier. And then just feel the abdominals turn on as you exhale and knit your ribs together. So we're just breathing. We're just breathing in. Arms are just down. We're not moving our arms at all. We're just, you guys, um, um, my, my Switzerland people, yeah, you're not moving your arms. You're just, arms are just down by your sides. We're just breathing. We're just breathing. We're just getting on our roller. We're on a roller. So we're just breathing on a roller. Awesome. Now, once you feel that kind of back rib cage heavy, you feel that back curvy part of your head nice and heavy, and you feel your shoulders, you're going to use your abdominals to reach your arms up to the sky. And again, palms are facing each other. Fingertips are up towards the sky. And you're grounded through your legs equally on the right and left sides. Again, not a big range of motion. It's just an inhale to start to reach your fingertips up towards the sky. And then feel those shoulder blades separate a little bit as you do that. And then exhale is just letting those shoulders drop with gravity and doing that again. So it's separating between the shoulder blades a little bit as you inhale up. And then it's finding that beautiful wide shoulder position and flat shoulder blade as you exhale and just melt your shoulders towards the floor. And you're just going to do that a couple more times, just investigating where should my shoulders be, what muscles are turning on when I reach up front, right? For the front working, what muscles work are work turning on when I'm flat and I have that flat shoulder blade and wide shoulder blade equal. I have that equal work in the front of my body equal work in the back of my body. And that's what you want to live in is that equal front and back area. Let's investigate that one more time. Just finding the perfect position for your shoulders. It doesn't have to be huge when you reach up. It's just enough to feel a little bit of movement. Now with that wide shoulder position, so you drop down into gravity, you're going to keep your right arm up to the sky if it feels okay. 
you're going to take your left hand onto your right rib cage. So that same arm, it's the same rib cage. And just make sure you still have that beautifully wide shoulder and flat shoulder blade. Fingertips are up towards the sky. And as you carefully start to investigate an overhead motion, which might be an inch or all the way high behind you, I want you to feel that rib gently pull down towards your hip bone and then bring it back up. And let's just do that two more times on that side. Yeah, just nice and slow motion overhead. As that arm goes overhead, you feel that rib gently pull down towards your hip bone and you feel your abdominals connect. Now let's just try that on the other side. So you're gonna take your left arm up to the sky. You're gonna take your right arm on your right rib or your left rib cage. So same arm up to the sky, left arm, same hand on that rib cage over on the other side. Drop the shoulder wide. You can do a shoulder shrug if you're not sure you're in the right position. And then once you've got that nice wide shoulder, you're just gonna start to again, reach overhead. Yeah, nice job, and And then you're gonna feel that rib gently pull down and you're gonna bring that arm back up. Finding your breath to support that movement. It's an inhale to go back. Good, nice and easy. Inhaling, or you can exhale. If you wanna exhale, that's okay too. Yeah, as long as you're breathing. Two more times, gotta keep breathing. Now, the next thing that might be kind of fun to explore is to see if your abs are reacting to that heavy arm bone. So you're gonna take your right arm back up to the sky. And if you wanna investigate that, you're gonna take your left hand to your tummy where we were kind of poking our tummy when we were breathing earlier, just kind of right around where that belly button is. And then you're just gonna take that arm overhead and see if you can feel your tummy tone a little bit with the weight of the arm bone and then bring it back up. Yeah, just a little bit of work in the center as the arm goes overhead. Yeah, nice. You feel that a little bit? Looks good. We're gonna do that one more time, just reaching the arm overhead and the hopefully the abs will, those deep abdominals will feel obligated to turn on because you've got a heavy load overhead. So they should turn on to support you. Now let's just try that three times on the other side. So you're gonna take that other arm up to the sky, maybe shrug it if you're not sure it's in the right position, just shrug it down towards the floor. And then again, reaction to your center as rib cage pulls down and arm goes overhead. And it's not about how high your arm bone goes, it's just about whether or not you find that wide shoulder and flat shoulder blade and your ribs stay kind of stable as your belly turns on. Exactly. Nice work. Now, once you found that, any, any little thing you wanna do there, if you wanna move your shoulders around a little bit, you wanna breathe another time, just stretch in any way you need to or move in any way you need to before we're going to come off that roller if you're on the roller and we're going to investigate something a little bit different. But if your body needs to move in a certain way, let it move how it wants to move before we come out of there. And then that roller is going to go to the side and we're going to investigate kind of a, a deeper, deeper dive into that arm overhead motion. And the next place we're going is going to be what we in PT sometimes call dead bug, which is basically opposite arm and leg reaching away. And it's gonna be a coordination between the upper quadrant and the lower quadrant, unless there, unless there are questions about that one. Doing, doing okay? So we're gonna, we're gonna have that, now we're flat, support your head if you need, and we're gonna, with, with Kim, investigate, you want your little towel there? We're gonna investigate how we can move body parts but keep our center supporting us. Because that's real life, right? We're not just reaching one arm overhead, arm overhead on a roller and just breathing deeply and having a minute to do that. We're moving something and the legs moving and we're reaching for something. So she's going to reach her right arm up to the sky and she might shrug it again if she wants to kind of find that connection, shrug it down and wide. And then she's going to use her abdominals and her exhale and that deep feeling of belly to spine to float her left leg, opposite leg up to tabletop. You just notice how her right leg moved a little bit. She found a little instability on that right side, but she's going to ground through that right side. Again, this is not about a big motion. It's about coordinating your upper and lower body and finding that diagonal line of connection between your internal and external obliques. We have these little crosses across our body like this. So what she's going to find in her, yeah, her left hand, if she wants feedback and go on her belly, I love it. It's a great idea wherever you want it, Kim. But she's going to start to reach arm and leg away. Her left leg is going to stay bent and it's going to start to lower towards the mat. And her right arm is going to start to reach overhead. But it's not about the destination. It's about the belly turning on. And then it's going to come all the way back up towards the center. So we're coordinating just as if in, in real life we were walking, right? We swing the opposite arm and leg to walk. 
we want to be able to use our upper and lower body at the same time. And we want to be able to stay connected through our center as we move those body parts and not lose our center or wobble around. She's also really having to stabilize through her right side, that right side grounded onto the mat so that her knee, that right knee doesn't fall out to the side. And then she's going to come back up. So that concept again of, of unfortunately, let's do a few on the other side. So just gently allow arm and leg to go down. Take a nice big breath into the rib cage, and then we're going to take a left arm up, exhale, sink the belly and float right leg up to tabletop. And she's going to reach opposite arm and leg away as she, yeah, she takes them away. So it's going to be toe taps. It's going to be stay bent. We're going to stay bent as you go away. Good. So, so we want to be able to do two things at one time, at least in daily life. We want to be able to step forward and push a door open and feel like we can keep our center connected. But as a hypermobile person, that's sometimes a big thing to ask my body to do, to be able to do two things at one time and still stay connected to my center. So we're going to practice that now unless there are any questions. So and again, it's not about how far the arm goes or the leg goes to the floor. It's about can I move upper and lower, whether it's an inch or two feet, and I stay connected in my center and I know where my back rib cage is. Lay down comfortably, support your head however you would like to support it. And then just take a nice big breath in, right? That rib breathing again, just settle yourself into the mat. And once you've kind of settled yourself into the mat, yeah, you know where I'm going, just to that foot, you're going to float your right arm up to the sky. And you're going to maybe do a shrug if you need to, to find that position of shoulder and shoulder blade. And then you're going to use your next exhale to sink your belly, find your deep abdominals and float your opposite left leg up to tabletop. And then once you're in that position and you feel nice and grounded, Beautiful job. Yeah, why not? And then we're just going to inhale or exhale those legs away, whatever finds you find those deep abdominals, draw that rib cage down, and then bring the legs back up. We're really grounded through that stabilizing right side. And we're really grounded through that back rib cage. Beautiful job, Annie. So you're just finding that motion. Now I'm doing a bent leg up and down, but you could straighten that leg away. That's great too, because it's even harder for those abdominals. You want to make sure that knee stays really grounded, right? Yeah, exactly. Right in front of your hip bone. And we're just going away. And I love that a lot of you have your hand on the belly to feel that feedback because we need that feedback. It helps so much. Like a helping hand, literally, right? Our hands are helping us. Now, once you've found that, we're going to settle however is easiest, arm and leg down. And we're going to take a nice big breath again. Find that settling down, that grounding down. And then you're going to find that other arm up to the sky. And then you're going to, on your exhale, sink the belly and find that other leg, opposite leg up to tabletop. And then just notice as you did that, if your stabilizing side moved a little bit, as we start to, again, separate and come back together, taking the upper and lower body away and coming back together, making sure you go slow enough with that motion that you can really find the important things, which is not the arm and leg. The important things really are that your center turns on to that reaction of heavy load of your arm and leg reaching away. And just do that two more times, kind of exploring that motion of I can move my arm and leg and keep my rib cage right where it is, keep my shoulders nice and stable, and keep my stabilizing side on the mat really stable. So I have a lot of stability as I do that motion. So when some things are moving and other other things are not moving, and that's really important to know what's moving and what's not moving. Just ground yourself down and do any stretch or movement that you need before we move to the next place that we're going to go. So if you want to hug your knees to your chest, if you want to stretch your legs up to the sky, if there's anything that would feel good for your body to just be your own body for just a moment. And if there's any questions, just let me know because we're kind of moving into a really different area in a moment. Kim. Yeah. The opposite. Yeah. Yeah. So Annie, Annie was just, um, just bringing up a really good point that the, the arm that wasn't moving. So say we have the left arm up to the sky and the right shoulder was on the mat. What she noticed with Kim was that that right shoulder that was supposed to be wide and grounded on the mat was kind of moving off the mat and rolling forward a little bit off the mat. And that doesn't have as much stability for her. So some attention to that groundedness of the flat shoulder blade 
and wide shoulder on that opposing side that's not moving is going to create more stability, which is going to help you. And more core, right? If I'm more grounded into the mat, for sure. Thanks, Annie. Anybody have any questions? So the next place we're going to move on to is prone. And I want to give you some options for prone because I can I find that for my own body, but also bodies that have hypermobility, laying on our belly doesn't always feel awesome if we don't have the right support for it. So I'm going to demonstrate some of these motions in a kneeling seated position, but you could also be standing if you needed to, if laying on your belly doesn't feel good. We can also prop your belly with a little towel or if there's a pillow or anything. Yeah, if you need a blanket and that can also give you support if you need it in that prone position. But we'll talk about that a little bit more when we prop Kim in a moment. But first, Kim's, I'm going to move this way just a little bit. We're going to, no, you're fine, Kim. You just be comfortable. But first, I'm just going to kind of demonstrate what we're going to do in a prone position, which is what, what I call, or Zaina calls this, I think, W arms. So I'm kind of describing the, the letter W, or some people refer to it as cactus arms. But you'll notice that my elbows are just a little lower than my shoulders, and my Palms are down as if I was on the floor, right? My palms would be on the floor. So I'm, I'm recreating that kind of prone position and I'm just kneeling. And when I'm in this position, I want to make sure I roll my shoulders back and down. So I have my upper trapezius and I have my shoulders down and my elbows. They don't pin in, but they're, they're not up. They're, they're gently drawing down. Crown of the head is reaching up to the sky and the neck is nice and long in the back. So when I'm in that position, if I'm in that position, we can do what we call W squeezes, which is just gently, again, always gentle, not a big range of motion, but just gently squeezing between our shoulder blades. Because when I squeeze between my shoulder blades, I'm turning on those muscles that can change the posturing when I'm like this to turn on those muscles that sometimes are a little harder to turn on, our lower trapezius, our lat muscles, our rhomboids, yeah, and that those muscles that draw our shoulder blades together. So that's going to be the first motion. And then the second motion is going to be a swan, which I can do in kneeling too. So if I'm kneeling here with my W or cactus arms and I grow tall through the crown of my head and I just lift my sternum forward and up towards the sky this way, instead of going back like that, I can get a little openness through the front and in this thoracic spine that lives under my, under my rib cage. If I just do that little bit of arching again, it's not about arching and going back. It's about arching and opening the heart forward as if the sternum was going to come to the mirror in front of me as I turn on those muscles that I turned on with my W squeeze. So that's one option kneeling, but I'm going to have Kim come onto her belly and she can put a blanket under her belly if she needs to. Let's just demonstrate if it's okay real quick to demonstrate. If you need support, you've got a pillow or blanket underneath your belly, which will put your lower back on a little bit of a rounded um, flexion in your spine, which might feel good for some of you guys. She's going to find her W arms to her sides and she's going to rest everything down. First thing that she's going to do is reach out the crown of the head to draw her nose off the mat just half an inch. And then she's going to draw her belly gently towards her lower back. She's feeling a little bit of abs. And then she's going to, if she feels okay, float her W arms just off the mat. Again, you could do this kneeling because this is really hard what she's doing. And then she's going to just do a little squeeze of her shoulder blades in and release, in and release. So she's getting that musculature between her shoulder blades. Lower body's heavy. She's not working too hard down here, but her glutes might turn on a little bit. That might feel nice to have a little glutes. And then she's going to take her arms down, nose floats down for just a moment. And then that next one I was demonstrating, which was sternum a little bit forward towards the mirror in front of me is going to be palms traction, palms glued to the mat, like sticky paper, so really glued, elbows just gently pulling to hip bones, head pulling to mirror to traction long, and then with her sticky palms, she's going to float her sternum just off and get a little micro baby arch to get all these muscles to support her in this position. And then she's going to come back, and it could be even smaller than that. And then we're going to go down again. Nice job, Kim. Beautiful swan. And she's going to grow long through her spine. She's going to draw her shoulders down her back. She's going to have her sticky palms. And then she's going to get tall and long through the back of the neck as she floats just off. And it can be really tiny. She's got a little bit of abs support. She's got a little bit of glute support. But again, you can do this kneeling or standing if laying prone doesn't feel okay. So if you guys are ready to try it, 
You're going to either kneel, stand, or come prone. Support your belly if you need to with something underneath you. And we're going to turn on some of those muscles in that W position. Once you're in that position, I want you to think of letting your lower body be pretty passive, except for the glutes. You could turn on your glutes by pressing through the front of your hips. And then once you find that, feel free to walk around if you need to, Kim, or do it if you want to do it. It doesn't matter. Once you found that position and you found those W arms, you're going to feel your shoulders nice and down away from your ears. You're going to feel your butt, belly button just gently pull towards your lower back, not too much work. And you're going to make sure those elbows aren't too wide out to the sides. So you just have it slightly more pulled in. Nice, Annie. You're going to float your nose just a hair off the mat, the tiniest, tiniest float. And then you're going to keep pulling your abs in as you gently float your arms just off the mat. And just do the tiniest squeeze between your shoulder blades. Squeeze. Tiny, really tiny squeeze. Yes, beautiful, Jennifer. That's exactly it. So you're getting a little bit of rhomboid and a little bit of lower trapezius. You're getting all that good stuff. Turn it on to support your shoulders and your shoulder blades. Nice work. Squeeze. Now that's a lot of work. So let's not do too many of those, right? Let's just let that go for a moment. Head goes down. Everything goes down. For this next one, yeah, awesome. Would love it. Totally. Yeah. For this next one, hands are going to stay sticky. Palms are sticky. Yeah. Like you got sticky glue on your hands. Your elbows are going to draw gently towards your hip bones. Belly pulls just a little bit off the mat. Glutes are active by pressing through the front of the thighs. You're going to grow long through the back of the neck. And then you're going to gently and slowly float up into a baby swan by bringing your sternum forward and lifting up. And then just lower back down. And let's try that again. Notice how if your legs are heavy, have your legs nice and heavy. And then you're going and then you're going to slowly and carefully sticky fingers on the mat, long neck reaching, elbows down, and you're going to float up just the micro miniest bit. Chin in, back of the neck is long. And you're going to do that just one more time. I'm just going to touch you if it's okay. Not on my glutes by pressing through my hips. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Nice job, Ann. That's beautiful. Sticky fingers. Yeah. And then come down and do a stretch or anything that would feel good. For Kim, right away, what she wanted to do was do a child's pose. For some of you, a cat might feel better. You're just kind of following your body where it might want to go after that. So again, we're trying to find the muscles that support our shoulders, our shoulder blades, and our head in the right position. And a lot of those muscles are in the back that are harder to turn on. So we're really working on those in that prone position. So um, Zane, I just want to check in with you for a moment. I was going to do neck isometrics, but I just don't know if we have enough time because I think you yeah. might want to take over now. Yep. Yeah. Let's maybe we'll add those back at the end. We can just yeah. do them quick. I think, end. yeah. I'll turn it over. Okay. okay. Should I take my microphone out now? Maybe let's just mute you unless you, and then you can just unmute you when you need to say something. Says, yeah, I'll do that. There's a question in the chat um, about why so few reps. Why so few reps? Love that question. So I, we have a lot of Kimmy. I love, I love, I don't necessarily do so few reps. It's because we have a lot of stuff and we want to do a lot of stuff. Um, with with this stuff, you want to have enough time to really find it and find it for your body. So I would take more time with it. I would go a little more slowly through it with more repetitions normally. But I would also was thinking of Zena, and Zena has a huge amount of wonderful stuff. And I didn't want to take over too much time. So that's why I was kind of moving quickly. But great okay. question. So, I, I would. So when we do these on our own, um, I, I, yeah, because we're you know we're trying to counteract a tendency that's that we're otherwise in all day long. So I'm trying to figure out that balance between overdoing it and being type A about it versus making real progress. I I love that question. And I, and I think Zana might have an answer to it, but I'll just say really briefly that when I do some of those exercises, I, again, am thinking about that equal work front and back. So it's not even about lifting very high to overdo it. And especially in the swan or in the W squeezes to squeeze and, pin and pinch too much. I'm just thinking to say hello to those muscles, but still have some musculature in the front. So what I think of when I do that position is I think of just, I, I imagine I call it my supergirl position. I don't know why I call it my supergirl position, but I imagine I'm flying 
and I don't even really lift. And I sometimes lift my legs, but you don't have to, but I'm just floating my body just off kind of flat. I'm almost neutral. So I'm not big and up and I'm not squeezing my shoulder blades together. I'm just trying to feel those muscles in the back turn on enough, but not overdo it like you're talking about. Then I'm not doing too much. So the way I would think about it, and Zainab, I had a different way of thinking about it, is that I'm just floating up more of a neutral. And when I do that swan, it's just the tiniest little idea of my sternum peeking forward as if I had, you want to show everybody my heart a little bit, but it's not big. It's just to get that idea of the muscles in the back without aggressively doing it. Yeah. And then I was just going to add in terms of numbers of repetitions, my preference is not too many at once ever really and ideally that you're making corrections throughout the day so i find that first of all what anna was alluding to is that working too hard doesn't help it actually makes things worse and because if you're a mobile person you work the muscles really hard you can then sublux a joint right so keeping the work like anna was saying really quite low would be better um, in terms of intensity, as she was saying, but then in terms of repetitions, I really wouldn't do more than four or five. And, and like Anna was saying, take it slow. And then if you can do it, especially if you're trying to fix a posture, three, four, even sometimes five times a day, just for two minutes, just to change the po habitual posture that you're in. Um, again, really gently, but few repetitions at a time more frequently, I think is a better bet usually. I'm gonna carry on from here and I'm gonna move a little bit more quickly because as Anna said, we have a lot of things we wanted to share with you. So um, I wanted to take you into all fours position. So quadruped, all fours. If you have trouble with your wrists, you maybe just wanna take them out of the picture for the moment by putting your forearms on a box or on a chair um, elevated so that you could be on forearms instead of on outstretched hands and wrists. So I'm going to have Tatiano demonstrate it on all fours um, and we'll do a quick demo and then I'll have you trying it um, as soon as you feel ready. So basically he's going to come onto his all fours and he's going to just try and find a neutral position, which sounds like nothing's happening, but really um, it's a lot of work to find neutral if you're unstable in your upper quadrant, right? So the focus is going to be that same shoulder slap idea that Anna was talking about earlier, he's going to just create a little distance between his shoulder blades. So they're going to move a little bit wider onto his back so that he doesn't have a big gap or drop in between his shoulder blades. The main mistake here that people make is they lift the ribs thinking that now they're getting their shoulder blades on their back. But this is just actually rotating the thoracic spine into or putting the thoracic spine into flexion. So he wants to stay neutral. And then at the same time, just press, I call it pressing the mat away gently with those shoulder blades, just to create enough space between the shoulder blades that he's not sinking between them. So if you want to hop onto all fours, you can just try and find that neutral position, either on wrists or on forearms. We'll start there and just, you're going to hold neutral. The other piece about that is again, that head posture. So if you or your client of yours or whoever has a tendency to drop that chin forward. Here's a great place to really think of lengthening out the back of the skull, following the line of the spine. So thoracic spine, there's a little curve down, but then the head should be back at the level of your thoracic spine and your tailbone's gonna reach out the back end of that. So my favorite image is to imagine that you have a string tied on your coccyx and a string tied at the very top of your head and those strings have tension and they're just pulling in a straight line away. And to play with this concept, you could rock a little bit forward and backward on your shoulders. So just play with the movement, that movement's happening at your hips really more and your arms are going for the ride, but you're gonna keep that same posture at your shoulder blades. So the tendency is to start dropping between those shoulder blades as you rock, but you just want to keep that same distance between the shoulder blades the whole time. So this is stabilizing serratus anterior, serratus anterior. Great. So then we can actually then go to work on serratus anterior. And you're welcome to do this along with or watch first and then try it. So here I'm going to let Tiziano drop his spine in between his shoulder blades. So, and you may be too far away to see that, but his shoulder blade just pops right off his back here. 
Now he's going to push the floor away again, enough that he's opening them up. So now we're actually strengthening serratus. The hard part about he's just going to keep going. But the hard part here is to isolate that and not go into that thoracic flexion that we don't necessarily need and keep the length of the back of the skull the whole time. So he's going to move to that action. If that is enough, he can stay there. If that's pretty easy for him, we can actually take this, or if one side's weak, we can actually take this onto one arm. And this is a lot harder, but I like to demonstrate it because I like the position. So if he takes his right arm and just brings it into his chest here, I'm gonna just bring it across you, yeah. So then he's gonna allow it to drop, allow himself to drop a little bit into the floor. And then he's gonna push away again with that shoulder blade, but now he's gonna allow a tiny bit of rotation the right shoulder opens to the right. And what that helps him do is stack up over his shoulder. So let's do the other side. Maybe you'll see it better. He's going to cross the arm across his belly. He's going to let himself fall down a little bit. And then he's going to push away, add a tiny bit of rotation. And you can see that that really helps that engagement into the whole shoulder and arm down into the floor. And then he can relax down and do it again for us. He relaxes down, and then he's going to press, push away, and let that shoulder blade come onto his back Yeah, as he goes. So again, this is quite advanced for somebody with unstable shoulders, but it is a really nice progression. Zane, so you can, can start with the two you. arms. I, I, just, yep. I think people weren't getting the rotation here, so I just want to make sure everybody kind of got that yep. piece of it. That yep, go when ahead. You're, when you're doing that single-armed one, can, mm -hmm. can you hear me? Yes. When you're doing that single arm one, it's sink, turn on serratus, mm -hmm. puffy, right here, and then a little bit of rotation and wrap, not aggressive, just to get it even a little bit more. Like your wrap mm -hmm. is like a wrap of the shoulder, like you're screwing in a light bulb this way. So you get to yeah. have that little bit of rotation at the end. Just want to make sure people got that. They weren't quite seeing the rotation. Okay, yeah. I'm out. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So did you guys get that on Zoom too? That there's just a little bit of that rotation just puts him on top of the shoulder a little bit more on top of that shoulder blade so he can feel that um, work a little bit more clearly. Yeah, and challenge himself a little bit more if he wants to. Um, okay, so then we can add on to this quadruped again. So I, I love this position just because it is really challenging, but we're going to leave the arms and upper quadrant, which is what we're focused on stabilizing right now, Still. So the idea is that nothing moves in this upper quadrant from his shoulder blades up through his head. He's going to stay exactly the same. And he's going to exhale. On his exhale, slide one foot out from underneath him without lifting it and tuck his toes under on the floor. So he's going to reach through the heel, reach through the head, and he's going to keep lifting through his center. So we have not changed his upper quadrant at all. We're just stabilizing the whole time. Then he's gonna slide that leg back in and he's gonna, without changing anything, he's gonna slide the other foot out. So the idea is that we're super focused on stabilizing this whole quadrant. The problems that come up here is that people tend to start putting more and more weight to the front part of their body onto their arms. In reality, the weight, I tell people that the weight has to be in their belly. So this has to hold the body. So his weight could actually stay even further back. So his hands are really light. And then he has to really stabilize with his belly as his leg goes. And he's going to keep working to lift up just a tiny bit more. Yep. And then send that leg away. And then bring it back. So if he's in the right position, if he's using his lower quadrant to help him stabilize the upper quadrant, then he could progress this to take the one leg out, leave it out there and then take the opposite arm into the chest is where I would go. Again, without moving opposite arm, so it'll be the right arm. Yep. So then he would have to hold this position and I go into the chest so I don't have to worry about what is happening when the arm goes overhead um, and it makes it just a little bit easier. Yep. And then you're gonna come back, bend the knee and then the arm goes down, right? And then you could do that on the other side. So. It might be too much to have the arm come up when the leg's out. If that's the case, you could just stay on both knees and bring the arm in, one arm in, leaving both knees down. 
So that would be a step in between if this got to be too much too fast. Yeah, but again, we're really keeping all of this still. And then that weight should not be traveling upward to the head, right? The more you do, the more it goes to your head is the wrong idea. It really needs to stay on the back end, right? Eventually, those hands could be super light. So there shouldn't be, at the end of the day, wrists and fingers and everything sore from having so much weight on those arms. Yeah. I'll give you guys a couple of minutes just to keep going with that. Let um, the legs slide out. Explore if that's enough for you. Um, if it's if you can take more, try the arm. If the combination's too much, just try the arm without the leg. Yeah. And then just working on keeping all of this connected and still. And then I'm sure you guys have seen all different progressions. There's all kinds of motions you can add to that, right, to make it more and more challenging, but always with that stability in mind. Perfect. All right. So any thoughts, questions? Great. I just put one in the chat. Sorry, I'm so inquisitive. I was feeling okay. it a little bit in my upper traps, and I was yes. wondering if that means I'm doing something wrong. Yes. So if the upper traps start working, then that – that is that first thing that I talked about in the very beginning about that overworking upper, not getting, maybe the shoulder blades are not quite even getting onto your back. Sometimes um, just shifting the weight a little bit to the back carriage. Um, and sometimes even turning the fingers just a little wide, wider out will help you find an engagement more in a diagonal down across from your shoulder blade across to your opposite pelvis. So a little turnout sometimes will help you find a little more engagement. So there, then it makes it just a little harder for the upper trap to kick in. So maybe try those little cues. Yeah, great, great. Okay, so I'm gonna switch positions a lot. I'm gonna have Tatiana come up to standing. Um, and there's always, I always wonder if I should put you in standing if you're a hypermobile person, my client or you guys today. Because now we have to deal with hips, knees, ankles, feet. Um, so for today, I'm going to imagine that they are in perfect alignment the whole time, just so that I can focus on the upper quadrant. Um, we know that if we have clients who are hypermobile, well, actually zero of my clients come in with perfect lower body alignment, but we're going to pretend for today. If it's challenging for you to be on your feet and focus on your upper body, you're welcome to sit down and block that pelvis in a seated position. That would be absolutely fine too. So. Here, what we wanted to look at first is what has happened to that head. And Anna alluded to this earlier on, right? The occiput is one of my favorite places to focus. So I'm going to have you turn your back to them. Luciano's turning his back on you. The occiput being the base of the skull here. I love to think about fixing posture by getting taller, growing taller, unloading the spine. So I like to think of the occiput as the thing that needs to reach us upward. If the occiput climbs to the sky, what we get is a little tiny drop in the chin. And that top of the head that Anna was talking about earlier, just gets longer and longer, right? So here you can cue yourselves. So I encourage you to try and put the thumbs at the back of your skull. So the initial putting the thumbs back there, a lot of times people climb up in their shoulders. So get your thumbs there and then relax your shoulder blades down your back. Yes. If your elbows have to drop a bit, that's fine. And then from here, you're just gonna take a breath in. You're gonna exhale, let the shoulder blades drop and uh, really gently lift the hands to the sky and just super gently press your occiput into your thumbs. And it's so small and so little that it's not, no. there's no force, it's just a lengthening. You should feel like you get a little bit of space there, right? So if it's super challenging for you to have your arms in that position, you could go against a wall and roll up a little towel behind your skull and just practice being there with that little um, roll. You could also do it laying down with a towel if being against the wall is too hard. So there's lots of ways to get there, but that's the idea, right? The back of the skull gets to grow longer. So we're gonna try that with some other things happening. So here, if you would grab your TheraBands, and we are lucky in here, we have uh, all kinds of things to hook them to on the walls. If you have a spot, I know in the ballroom in California, there's the ba ballet bar. 
So yes, you want to ballet bar, and I just wanted to give a ten minute warning for yep. everyone. So, um, for us here, we're gonna just attach the band to our springboard. Um, but you, you guys in California can use the ballet bar. If you guys don't have either of those, you could use a door and lock it into a door. Um, you can tie a knot and lock it into a door. Basically, I'm going to have him. Now, therabands I know can be hard if you have any hand issues. So I prefer to wrap the band around the base of the hand uh, just one time loosely. If, if it's a theraband, if you need handles, you're absolutely welcome to use handles. Um, a lot of times my clients have to get a set of handles because the bands aren't, are too much for them. So consider that as well. But the exercise itself, he's going to go not too far away from his band. So he's going to step up. Their elbows and arms are going to ideally stay really straight. The resistance should not be so hard that he can't pull his arms behind his hips. So I want his arms, to, him to pull. He's going to exhale, pull. And I want the arms to be able to pass his body. So if your arms can't pass your body, you need to take a step forward. Right? And then he's going to slowly release. The elbows stay straight. And we're going to start by activating in the sort of down or diagonal right, with these muscles that go diagonally across to the opposite pelvis, and then pull backward. While he's doing that, this occiput that we just talked about should be growing taller. He should be getting up tall. The reason we want the arms to pass the body is so that we get activation in the posterior of the body, right? We're trying to get rhomboids on. We're trying to get posterior structures on in the back body. The weight of his body should go towards the balls of his feet a little bit, right? And in fact, if if I really want him to grow tall, he should feel like he could easily lift up on the balls of his feet in this position, right? If his posture stays up and doesn't drop forward, right? So the danger is here that people pull back too far and the shoulders roll forward. So you want to make sure that the shoulders stay rolling backward. Sometimes if that's not happening, I turn the palms forward. So I pull back and then turn the palms forward and then have them just hold that, then turn the palms back to neutral. So neutral being facing the body and then let the arms go a little bit in front again. So again, that's you could pull back, rotate the palms to the front of the room. That's going to externally rotate the shoulders at the top. Then he's going to try and keep that action, turn the palms to his body and then let the arms go forward again. Yeah, so posterior activation in combination with elongation, right? And then we get that really nice strengthening in the back body. We get an elongation or a lengthening in the front um, and the lengthening of the spine upward. So a little back, yeah, that and up, great. So the other thing that I have, to, we have to have two more things in here. I'm going to go quickly just so that you have them. You're going to keep your band. Um, you can, if you have one in each hand, you're just going to turn sideways to wherever your band is coming from. Right. I can't talk about shoulder stability if I don't talk about rotator cuff exercises. So the rotator cuff muscles, <laughs> Gloria is smiling. <laughs> the rotator cuff muscles are really the a, a key in a hypermobile shoulder, a shoulder that doesn't have the ligamentous support it needs or capsular support to hold the shoulder in its socket, right? The socket that we sort of have. So internal and external rotation are what we're talking about. Um, I like to do it uh, with the elbow at the side and I like to do it starting at the belly for external rotation and opening only to the width of the shoulder and then back to the belly. Right, I keep it really contained. Why? Because then I don't have to worry about an unstable shoulder going too far into external rotation. It's super contained and it's gonna get strengthened in this position. The other thing to really think about in external rotation is there should be some pressure towards the body. So in a body like Tiziano's where he's pretty straight in his side, he can just squeeze his arm against his body. And somebody who's a little more curvy, that might be challenging. So you might put a towel to fill up the space. So there's contact on that side as he rotates. So he's going from belly to with the body and back to belly, right? That would be my external rotation. 
then the nice thing about having two ends is that he can just bring his other arm into action instead of the one away from the source, closer to the wall. He can go into internal rotation with the other arm. And that I like to start at the width of the body and go to the belly and then open again. So really, again, contained. Here, the difference is now we need to think about that shoulder blade again, right? That if he goes wrong on this one, that whole shoulder and the whole thing's going to go forward. We don't want that. We want to keep the shoulder blade in that diagonal kind of, I like to say that I duct tape the shoulder blade in a diagonal to his pelvis on the opposite side. Right? So I'm just going to duct tape it back here so that all he can do is actually rotate the head of the humerus. And then he's going to open, right? So you've got your duct tape shoulder blade for internal rotation. And then for external rotation, you're going to keep contact with the side. So tiny pressure inward as you rotate to the external and not going past the width of the body. Yeah. And then you would do it on both sides or, if, you know, pick, you'd understand which shoulder you were working on more. And then you would make sure you do internal and external rotation on each shoulder. Yeah. So that uh, is key for me. Um, we talked about serratus press on all fours. Um, we can do serratus press in standing. You can do it supine with a TheraBand behind you, but before I get you to the floor, I want to just add a low bicep curl. So again, I like to use the TheraBand, you can pull it out from there. And he'll just step on the middle of his TheraBand. No, in the middle. His elbow's at his side and his palm's up. And then he's just gonna do a little bicep curl. So you could do this seated, which is probably a little more stable. Well, definitely more stable, a little easier. Um, shoulder blades are connecting on the back. So again, we don't have um, the shoulders rolling forward. We wanna make sure that we've got that contact in the diagonals down the back. Wait, and then he's gonna curl up and slowly down and curl up. So internal external rotation, biceps curl. And then if I wanted to move to serratus in standing, my favorite way is to take that band out again. He's gonna bring it behind his shoulder blades on his back. So, and it, as wide as he can keep it, the wider, the better. He's gonna go under his arms and extend his arms straight out in front of him. Right, so this is the hardest place to do it because he doesn't have the feedback of the floor behind him, right? So it's hard to know how far back to go. But here you can see what's happening, right? So we'll keep him here for a moment. But then you could do this against the wall. Or you could do it laying on the floor. And basically, he's going to punch forward a little bit without bending the elbows. So just punch forward. This is the width that Anna was talking about. We're trying to get width across the shoulder blades. And then he's gonna let his arms stay straight, but the shoulder blades move together. And then he's gonna punch forward. I'm gonna have him turn his back to you guys now so you can see what's happening, right? So they come together, they widen. They come together and they widen, pushing away. And that you have to be careful here about those upper traps again, right? We don't wanna go forward, raising up. We wanna think about this sort of downward rotation of the scapula and then that width across the body without bending and then forward again. So the motion remains small. It doesn't have to be anything big. Again, here laying on the floor will stop his shoulder blades from going too far or against the wall will stop him from going too far. So here there's an option of really going too far back um, so that you wouldn't have if you had support there. But here at least you can see what's happening. And this is a great progression of exercise for people once they get more aware and have more stability. Um, okay, and so just to put everything together real quick, um, I love to have people work on calf raises, and I actually create like to create some stability by stepping on the band again and having the hands wrapped into the band or holding on or however with handles, or however works, really. So we're going to just stand here, take a little shoulder roll backwards, right? So we're just aligning that body. We're gonna come up a little forward and just rise up onto the toes, right? I'm gonna stretch the back of that skull up and then I'm gonna try and lower the heels 
without falling backwards or losing my posture, but just staying in that nice open posture. So little shoulder roll backward. If you need a little help getting those shoulders onto your back, the palms can roll forward. Then you're gonna just press gently up through the feet, right? Reaching that back of the skull, that occiput and top of the head up to the sky, and then slowly lower the heels back down. Great, one more time, shoulder roll. Palms turn forward if you need, you need that. And then just lifting up. Keep that nice length that you create. And then slowly lowering back down. As you lower those heels, think of stretching the head more up to the sky. So you end up really open. And then you can drop your bands. And hopefully you feel a little more connected in that upper quadrant and a little taller. Um, and then we have gotten through most of those exercises that we wanted to for today. Hey, Zaina. Yes. I have a question or a, 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 a discovery. When we were doing the chest expansion exercise with the TheraBand, and then you said um, externally rotate your palms, your shoulders, I was very surprised that my shoulders were not in place during a normal chest expansion. And I was like, I tried it again. And it was like, no, I still can rotate. And then I figured out I have to rotate at the beginning or I have to set something at the beginning before I begin the pullback. Is that okay to do? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. And actually, after you've pulled back, the first time I let people just pull to understand the motion, right? Yeah. Get the motion, get the shoulder blades on, do that rotation, try. And once once I get do the rotation, my shoulders go where I want them really to be. Then I try and keep that and turn my palms. And then I just try and keep it. I keep it. Okay. Even if my hands can't go, you maybe then your hands can't go as far forward. So even if you're coming just to the sides of your thighs and then back again, that's fine. The mo again, the motion itself is a little bit less important than the posture in this case. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Dana, can you hear us now? I can. Yeah. Great. So did you have a question? Well, I, I think my question is pretty obvious, but on the on the quadruped one, which is so great about the rotation and the opposite leg, I'm just thinking one client in particular who cannot put a weight on the wrist but has the hyperbobal of uh, uh, shoulders. So I would take it you just put it on the box. Yeah, which absolutely. So forearms on the box works. I think the best because then I take that whole hand wrist structure out of the picture so I can just focus on the shoulders um, and then also just positioning wise so making sure they're not too far away from the box so right. the more the more um the arms are in towards my body the easier it is for me to access the further out I go the further up away I go the less support I have in the shoulder socket, right? I keep saying socket. You guys know that I, what I mean, right? Positionally, it's a lot easier for me to stay connected to my lower body, my, even my thor thorax, if my elbow's a little closer, right? Okay. So I would make sure what happens on the box is we get too far away and then we don't feel stable anymore. So bringing it in a little bit, don't be afraid to get them to crawl right up to that box and, and then go on forms. But then I, you're right. I take this out. I can focus on the stability at the shoulder. And at a later time, I would want to try and stabilize those or maybe not with full body weight. Right. And you can probably still get that rotation there. Yeah, you actually can. It's a matter of just getting the other arm out of the way. So you may need to go to the belly instead of the chest. I just, I love the diagonal of having the arm there, but you could go in a downward diagonal and have the, the arm not working down here. Right. Or even if they can handle it, even just slightly behind. Yeah, that will open. Yeah. I do have one more. And it occurred to me that when you that when your arms are out in front uh, or above your body, your lats are on stretch and trying to pull that internal rotation of your humerus, correct? Yes. So the farther out you go, the more the lat is trying to do a rotation internal and the more you got to strengthen the external rot rotators. Yeah. yeah. And then quite and to be quite honest. In people who are hypermobile, the tension in the lats is not usually okay. such a big problem. What happens is it's just more work to stabilize the posterior diagonal. I see. So if you think of the fibers of the lats, which I didn't demonstrate right yeah. from anterior, 
right? And but my fibers are diagonal to my pelvis. Yeah. I like to take in mentally, I like to take that all the way to my opposite hip. So if I it's less about that I'm so tight in the front, usually. Um, it's more about I have so much work to do to stabilize all of this diagonal. Yeah. That, I see. Uh, okay. It's different for a hypermobile person. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Other, but otherwise, like in a general, pop, a non hypermobile, somebody who's been at their computer, it's yeah. the opposite, right? It's the okay. tr too much tension. To, even if they have the strength, they can't get there because they're just stuck with too much tension and tightness. That can happen in a hypermobile person too because they've been protecting a hypermobile shoulder and they've mm -hmm. closed down. It absolutely can. Mm -hmm. But it's worth kind of figuring out what's happening with that particular person. Got it. Great. Anna, did you have something to add? I just want to say that I really appreciate all of you joining us and, and being here. We're trying to, again, it's, it's, it's about the exercises, but it's also about community. So we're going to keep doing these um, on different so that we can continue to find this community. I find as a hypermobile person, Zaina is hypermobile as well, that there's not a lot of resources and it can be a little confusing on what to do and what not to do. So that's kind of what the impetus for this was, is that we keep this community going so that maybe the next workshop is one, an idea one of you has that you're struggling with because there's a lot of different body parts that I know I struggle with. So please feel free to be in contact because we do want to make this grow into a bigger community so that there's somewhere for people like us to go or people who help people like us to go to help people like us. So that's kind of, yeah, share information with everybody. Yeah, doctors, and we can help each other through this um, kind of difficult journey that it can be sometimes. So again, just appreciate you being here and look out. We'll be con continuing to build this hypermobility focus of a clinic as we go forward. Yeah, great. So great to see you all. Thank you so much again for all being here. Fantastic. Yeah. But um, I remain accessible, so hopefully I will hear from all of you again.